is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, season two ish, episodes 68 and 69. Nice. In these episodes, Kobe, I just didn't think we were going to get a bunch of episodes that were centered solely on Kobe. And also on the uh, erstwhile sidekick. Sidekick's the wrong word. Well, welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Um, Thank you very much to Bernadette for commissioning this episode. And erstwhile sidekick felt like the right thing to say at the time, but that doesn't feel like the right description of this dude. Who, by the way, I am going to call Helmet because his name sounds a little bit like Helmet and his hair looks very much like a helmet. So I'm just going to call him Helmet. And I feel like pretty much fine with that. Are you guys cool with it? Can I do that? I just like to try and adopt a name that is easy for me to recall quickly because y'all know how I am with names anyway. And if the name has more than three syllables, like all bets are off. Um, I really didn't expect for this dude to be such a major part of things. And honestly, this is one of those where I don't, um, I'm I'm interested in where they're going with it, but I didn't realize just how much my enjoyment of a character is linked to how much I like the way that they are animated. And he is so ugly in every respect all over him that I just don't want him on the show anymore because I don't like to look at him because he is so weird. He's got that that giant butt chin that's like Buzz Lightyear-esque. His hair, like I have said, it's not only a helmet, but it's like straight across bangs, which um, on a dude, I have just never ever in my life seen that work. It's always been a no-no for me. And the whole look of his face because of how like prominent the chin is, it makes the rest of his face look smaller and much more weaselly due to that. And just everything about him, I'm like, look, I'm not saying that you're like an irredeemable character. I'm just saying that I don't want to have to look at you anymore, dude. You're just you're creepy. You, you creep me out. Um, Gabriella says he is there to make Kobe look better in comparison, which I will grant is accomplished because you guys know that I had a like similar sort of reaction to Kobe and him growing up some has helped because he was just so like small and compact and annoying in so many ways. And he, his personality has changed very little in a lot of ways. It's just that he has decided that he is going to adopt this particular attitude that Luffy has that has inspired him. Which, um, you know, that is really what tends to happen, I think. Like, we don't have usually massive personality changes in our lives. That's not, like, universally true. But it tends to be that our personality remains fairly steady. And if we do make major changes, it's because somebody influenced us in a, in a big way. And we just have had to recall their influence over and over again. I know that's been true for me. So this I actually, when I realized that we were going to have a Kobe adventure, my initial reaction was kind of like, I guess. And I really quickly got over that. I actually enjoyed these episodes. I really grew to sort of like enjoy his dynamic with Helmet and the whole like new character that gets added this older guy what is his name admiral kang uh yang help me guys um 
But yeah, I don't really know what to make of this guy, which I think is part of the point. I really enjoy him. He's a really funny character, but I I feel off kilter when he's around because I didn't expect him to like tattle on them at the end of this. I kind of knew he was testing them, but he's so inconsistent. And that's not really fair. He's unexpected with the way he chooses to like deploy his testing. And I kept thinking that he was going to take a certain tack and then he would go in a totally other direction. And I was left standing there like, wait, what? Uh, Garp. I was way off. Wow. Now, see, guys, this is what I mean. Um, Admiral Garp. Vice Admiral Garp. Garp. <laughs> that He deserves better than that. Garp? Come on. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I just keep thinking about the uh the dude in hot fuzz that just says yarp. Um so let's back up and start from the beginning of these two episodes. There's something going on with Nami and the newspaper. She sees something and I just wanted to check in with you guys. I thought that I was paying pretty close attention and I didn't see what it was that was bothering her. Are we not supposed to know yet? Because I was just worried that I wound up missing it somehow. Um, but I don't think we are explicitly shown what's going on. I think we're just meant to notice that she spotted something and it's obviously in relation to Vivi and she isn't sharing it, but she's like, it either bothered her somehow or it's going to influence the way that she carries forward. I don't know. I am wondering if it's not like bad news um, because the way that she sort of didn't want to tell Vivi, but at the same time, Nami doesn't feel like somebody who would shy away from telling somebody something just because she was thinking that it would upset them. She's a pretty practical person. And the only reason that I could see not telling her is for some personal gain. No offense, Nami, but you're, you're cold blooded. And I have to assume she doesn't have the kind of like personal loyalty to Vivi yet that would make her care that much about Vivi's feelings. But I don't know. Um, anyway, so <laughs> I am, uh, so the the episode starts off with the wind dying on the ship and they are temporarily stopped again as nami said and you know this is coming at a really inconvenient time they're already feeling like they're you know under pursuit they're running behind their people after them um and sanji is talking about needing to go fishing and he can't find the bait and it turns out that luffy ate all the bait. And you guys, I had made the mistake of sitting down to to watch this while I was eating lunch. And I know that it's just an animation, but watching Luffy just eat a mealworm, whatever it is, it it really got to me. I didn't like it. <laughs> I mean, I know that Luffy is a maniac, but the fact that he is eating the bait, sir get a hold of yourself. Um, so as usual, everything starts to like completely go left on deck because people are fighting. There's a moment where he, uh, Luffy suggests using the little duck friend as bait. And of course, at this point, Nami has to yell at everybody to fucking chill. And we get a bit of a recap of all the people that Luffy has gone up against in the past and beaten um, because understandably Vivi is expressing some disbelief that Luffy has been that he, looking as <laughs> non-threatening and incompetent as he is uh, that he could possibly have beaten anybody. She just doesn't buy it. And everybody has to chime in with their, you know, retellings of how he has 
bested a variety of different badasses. And then there's a mention of uh, Kobe. And he is like talking about Kobe to um, to Nami. And he says, yeah, he's Kobe. He's my friend. And then we cut to this moment. And I was so confused about it. So what it turns out to be is that it's a dream. But we're seeing like Kobe and he's looking like he's like the captain or admiral on a ship. They call him sub-lieutenant. That's right. And he's wearing a jacket with all of these like pins, uh, medals pinned to it. And there are tons of rose petals or like cherry blossom petals, something floating in the air around him. And he's saying, Luffy, how are you doing? It's me, Kobe. Like he's writing a letter. After we parted ways, there were lots of hardships, but I've achieved my dream. And as he is in this dream, like pulling away from the dock and about to embark on this big adventure, whatever this was going to be, out of the water comes uh captain morgan looking like he's it, it's a weird i'm not really sure what the effect is meant to be i think it's meant to be that his skin is, is just like peeling off like he was rotting in the water or something because he like comes out and initially he looks like himself but then it, it, it begins to like move and short of sort of like shred off him and then there's just like muscle and weird like skeleton ish look underneath it and he attacks the ship that kobe is on and here comes luffy literally larger than life and he steps in and saves kobe's ship by just chucking this guy out into the ether and he disappears as he's thrown and all of this like sort of starlight sparkle appears and just falls down around them as if his body turned into stardust. And Kobe just says, wow, so pretty. And then wakes up and he is buried face first in Helmet's crotch. Now, guys, look. I'm just going to say it. Everything about this storyline is pretty homoerotic to me. And I was already in this moment feeling like, oh, shit. Does Kobe have like a crush on Luffy? I actually never thought about that, but I could totally see it. I mean, you know, like if somebody just steps into your life and saves you and is like as completely badass as Luffy seemed to be, and then they bounce, you know, and they just continue to grow in your mind as like a legend, sort of. I don't see why that wouldn't be what happens. And I was just in the midst of thinking like, hmm, I don't think that they would like go in that direction with this story, but I could definitely headcanon that. I could see it. So then when it opens up with his face buried in Helmet's lap, I was just like, Okay, am I being punked? Is this like purposeful? I felt like it was too on the nose. And I and the two of them continue to have this sort of like energy between the two of them, especially because of how very like uh, you know, shirtless and sweaty they are so much of the time. And I just kept thinking about the volleyball game in is it cocktail or what's the what's the movie um but yeah i just i started really feeling like i'm gonna go with this actually i kind of could dig kobe being gay or just queer and you know being into the various dudes that he comes across um top gun thank you kyle gabriella says this is one of those cover stories we had mentioned before, like buggies. They had to find a place to fit it in, but the transition is so weird. I forgot you guys had mentioned that. That's right. Um, so it turns out that uh, Captain Morgan's son, Helmet, has also been made into a chore boy as punishment for all of the shit that he pulled. And he is not happy in this position. Kobe is seeing all of this as an opportunity to do his best 
and work his way up, prove himself, and he doesn't expect anything more than to be given a lot of work. That's like full on what he's here for as far as he is concerned. Helmut is uh, seeing this very much as a punishment. He doesn't want to be here. He resents being lowered in station in life. He misses the good things. And honestly, as a fellow hedonist, I can't blame him. There is, I mean, you know, I'm not mad at that. It's just natural. That's what's going to happen. Kobe's attitude, while admirable, is like 0.5% of the population of humanity. The vast majority of us would be more of a helmet. And I don't think we want to admit that necessarily, but it's 100% true. And I'm not backing down on that. Um, and I want to be more of a Kobe in a lot of ways. I genuinely do. I want to be somebody who's just like, I've decided that I want this thing and I'm just going to literally do anything I can to get it. But I don't have that in me in a lot of ways. You know, I, there, it depends, you know, of course it always depends on like what we're talking about because a lot of people would argue that what I've done with a podcast is like a demonstration of that. And like to a degree, maybe, I don't know. Um, I've had a lot of support in this. It's not like it's just been nothing but adversity because I have gotten very lucky with the kinds of support that I've gotten. Um, so I don't love to take total credit for that in terms of it being just about my sheer will. And this is something that I think, again, reminds me of a lot of the Cradle series, because so much of the Cradle series, these people are advancing in their use of the sacred arts, which is essentially magic. And they are doing so in large part because they have such strong wills that they have exercised via a variety of like meditative techniques and those techniques are really challenging and the kind of thing that most people would give up on in favor of an easier method that shows more immediate results. And they wind up excelling at the sacred arts because they chose the hard way. And it's the sort of thing that, like, again, I would love to think that I would do that also. But I'm just not really built like that most of the time. I'm going to do what I need to do to get at, like, as good as I can. And then I'm going to go and move on with my life so that I can, you know, play some animal crossing and have a drink. I'm not somebody who's just ready to dedicate 100% of myself to something in that sort of way. But like, I sort of wish I could turn that on just for a few months and see what it's like to be that way. I don't want to tur like turn into that permanently. I don't want to change who I am as a person fundamentally, but I'd really like to see what it's like. Is it worth it? Because whenever you decide that you're going to focus 100% on something, that means that you are taking away from other things in your life. There's just no avoiding it. You are going to have to sacrifice other stuff that you like. And sometimes that sacrifice in retrospect might be worth it. And sometimes in retrospect, you might be like, look, I am really good at this thing now. And that has netted me some gains, but I'm, I'm sad that I missed out on all of these other things. Um, so, yeah, that's just something that I've often thought about, especially, you know, as somebody who has a sort of like on and off again relationship with fitness and weightlifting and stuff, I would like to be able to really fucking go for it. But I just never sustain that kind of intensity. Um, and that's really like the focus of these two episodes is what it is like for these guys to sustain that sort of intensity and really mean it. So... Yeah, Kobe and Helmet are being given chores and they're these couple of dudes that uh I they they sort of stop them in the hallway and are just like, "Hey, you know that you're never going to be become part of the Marines, right? Like you guys are really weak." And they give them a bunch of extra work and uh Let's see. You're both quite aware. None of, uh, neither of you were qualified to join the Navy, yet you were given special permission to join as chore boys, right? And Kobe's response is, yes, sir, of course. If there's anything I can do, I'll do it. Just give the order. And they both get this weird look on their face and they sort of sweat in a way that I did not understand what 
that response was meant to be. If they, the two dudes almost look like Kobe called their bluff a little bit. And I didn't really know what to make of that. But maybe it's just that they expected him to be more like chagrined. And instead, Kobe was like, yeah, no, we we know. And they didn't think they thought that they were going to put him down. And instead, he just completely like let it roll off him because to him, that's just a fact. I think that's probably what it is. But it didn't just it didn't quite come across for me. But anyway, yeah, uh, we'll also be honored to do your laundry. And Helmet is just like, what the fuck, dude? You don't need to like look for more work. What are you doing? And he's like, that's our job, though. That's what we're here for. Um, and Helmet's like, I mean, you can if you want, but mm, I'm not. So then we go to the yard and all of the Marines are doing laps while Helmet is on the roof, just sort of gazing at the sky, letting Kobe do everything. Kobe is hanging off the side of the building, washing the windows while Helmet is remembering what it was like to be in power. And... Kobe comes up to him and puts his hand on his shoulder and is just like, I wanted to tell you something as a friend. And he just yells at him, why should we be friends? And he's like, well, we're both chore boys. Um, And again, it's just Helmet is really resistant to seeing himself as actually being uh, like this person and of this status he keeps wanting to hold on to who he had been and sees this very much as like a temporary thing which um there is like no surer way to be less happy in the moment than to focus on the fact that this is going to be over soon and i mean that in every direction like whether or not something terrible is happening or like it'll be over soon it'll be over soon I mean, I don't like, it, it, will it? I, that's something that I went going through some of the hardest times in my life. People will keep telling me like, well, it has to get better for you soon. And I honestly had a little bit of that expectation because things did seem to be going so consistently badly for me. And it just didn't get better quickly at all. It took years. And I kept sort of focusing on the fact that it had to improve because I felt like that was the way to go in order to be positive, you know, but it's not exactly positivity. It's more like trying to mentally distance yourself from your actual circumstances. And I just don't know how helpful that actually is. And then there's things like this where, you know, something bad has happened and you're trying to pretend it hasn't. And like, how's that working out for you? You know, he can look back at the times where things were better, were closer to what he wants, but it's not actually creating them. And when he comes back to himself and realizes that that's not his reality anymore, it just makes him more upset. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. This is one of those things that I sort of get, um, I, I feel conflicted about because a visualization is a technique a lot of people talk about where like if you're trying to manifest something for yourself like the secret and you want to create a better version of reality that you're supposed to like stop and imagine that better reality as part of your like inevitable future and uh, I feel sort of the same way about that where I'm just like yeah but then you come back to your actual reality and like is that motivating to you or does it just make you sad in the moment that that's not how you're living? I guess it just depends on like your actual intent when you do it. But eh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, he reacts basically with like blaming Luffy for everything that has happened to him. He's like, you know, it, this is all due to that fucking straw hat asshole. He's ruined my life. It, if it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't be here. And Kobe, of course, sticks up for Luffy and is like, blaming your fate on other people isn't going to solve anything. And he says something like, wouldn't you agree that's the sign of a weakling? You used to live on your father's power, but from here on out, we're supposed to search for dreams of our own. And initially, Helmut gets real mad. And then when he says that he like has a dream to become a naval officer and crack down on bad guys. He 
seems to get Helmut's attention for a split second. Like, th- this was what sort of gave me some hope for how things would continue. Because Helmut's a dickhead to him. But it seems like interspersed with that is a certain amount of, like, wistfulness. He's angry at the fact that Kobe can stay positive. It's not even, like, the material of what Kobe is saying he disagrees with. It's more like he wishes that he could have this kind of attitude, which as somebody who also wishes I could be that way, I really recognize that. Like, it, it, And that can be a thing, reacting with anger to somebody who's able to maintain a headspace that you wish you could and you just don't really have it in you for that. I get it, you know? And it, I think to a point, you can train yourself to think differently. But it takes just so much work. It takes a lot of like conscious energy. And a lot of us don't really want to put in that kind of time, you know? Um, so they wind up getting in this big fist fight on the roof because he's talking about how, you know, he wants to achieve this thing. And Helmet's like, not only can you not, but this is Luffy's fault. And he's like, don't you dare talk about my beloved Luffy that way. And they wind up landing on like they fall off the roof and they land on a cannon and the cannon goes off and completely destroys an entire building and the two of them get into a huge amount of trouble um and they wind up getting like assigned to this job um they're talking about it i i wanted to ask you guys who are these people? They, it cuts right from them hanging out, uh, or no, not hanging out. I'm looking in horror at the building that they have just completely demolished and saying, we're sorry. And then it jumps to a woman and her like little girl feeding them. And she's like, you know, that sound was you guys. And here's some food and, Kobe says, yeah, we uh, managed to not get kicked out, but Helmut says we had to agree to work for free for 50 years, though, which is kind of worse. And I don't know who she's supposed to be, this lady. It was sort of a weird addition that I didn't see as necessary, and I don't know if it's because she or maybe her daughter are going to wind up being more important later because there's a scene with them later where the little girl gets really mad at one of the Navy guys for, like, letting these two get shipped off somewhere and she isn't allowed to say goodbye. But I don't like recall if these two were in the very early days of the show and I have just forgotten them. I feel like if they were, there would have been some reference to them because the show tends to sort of like remind you of things a little bit to, you know, especially if it happened that long ago. Um, Kyle says, I think they're the people from those episodes, the little girl who was helping Zoro when he was tied up. Oh, I'm really surprised that they didn't like explicitly say that. Or maybe they didn't. I just missed it. But okay, that makes sense. It was just like, I just did not put it together. And it was weird to me that these guys are able to like, just sort of leave the military campus and go hang out with this random woman and her kid. Um, But yeah, so... Uh, they are assigned to this, um, oh, and this is when the little girl shows them Luffy's, uh, baffling escape from Captain Smoker. And of course that means that he is headed for the grand line because of where this all occurred. And Kobe is really happy for him. He's just like, shit, man. He said that he was going to fight tooth and nail to achieve this dream. And it looks like he's doing it and good for him. So then they get assigned to this job where they are going to help with the transport of a prisoner and they look up and it's fucking Captain Morgan. I, (laughs) this whole thing is so weird. Long story short, he's being relocated somewhere probably to be executed And he, there's a moment later on where poor Helmet is like, they're polishing cannonballs, which I found particularly funny. Um, And Helmet is talking about how, 
you know, he knows his dad is a piece of shit, basically. But it's he's still his father and that he's like all like can't help but respect him and can't help but admire him in his way. And he's like, but I guess he did take things too far. And he starts crying and he's like, he's probably going to get executed, huh? And like, there's really not all that much that Kobe can say to comfort him because likely that is true. And Helmet seems like he's pretty much come to terms with that. It's just, you know, the realization that despite everything, he still actually does care about this guy some, which uh, this is just how this is, you know, and anybody who is the child of like a kind of shitty or abusive parent knows it can take a whole lot before you're finally ready to be like, okay, I've washed my hands of you because that's just part of like the parent child dynamic. You know, children are instinctively, they want to consider themselves safe um, with their parent and see them as a person to respect and look up to for instruction and how to be in the world. Um, so, here comes Garp and they are meant to be delivering Morgan to him. And this is a really weird situation. So first of all, Admiral Garp uh, is in this outfit that otherwise as an Admiral probably wouldn't really seem weird at all. It's mostly a pretty normal outfit. But then he's got this weird kind of helmet on that looks like a dog's head, like an actual dog's head, almost like it was a taxidermied animal. And it's really weird. He comes to get, uh, <laughs> to get Morgan. And he says something about how he's been awake for five days. And this Marine says, thank you for your hard work, sir. And he replies with, no, I've been going for a new donut eating record. But the lack of sleep and rest has gotten me a bit drowsy. And he pulls out another donut and takes a bite. And it looks like he falls asleep in the middle of the bite. He's in eight, at 842. And at this point, he begins to nod off in the midst of the conversation. And Morgan, who is like, what the fuck is with this guy, decides to take his advantage. And he slashes this guy down the front and takes his own son as a hostage and bails from the ship. And this is one of those, like, you know, coming of age moments for a character like Helmet, where he's like realizing that as much as he kept hoping and wishing that he meant something to his father, he's just not actually ever going to be anything to this dude. So when he realizes his father is like using him as a hostage, at first he's just like, Dad, what are you doing? And his father is very quickly like, your life means absolutely nothing to me. I could give a fuck. And I honestly felt bad for him. Like as much as I w expected to not feel anything for Helmet as a character when this happened, because this is not a new trope, right? That like a pathetic asshole winds up realizing that the person that they were relying on for their status and power is not only like just no longer available to them, but also ne like doesn't like or respect them in any way. But oftentimes when that is done, it's very satisfying to watch because you're like, yeah, finally this dude is realizing that he's like a joke and that none of the bullying that he has managed to pull off so far is due to his own intimidation it's simply due to who he was connected to and so it's fun to watch a dude like this be brought low and realize like there is nothing inherent about him that makes him intimidating to anybody 
But with Helmet, we already saw that part of him be brought low. And because he's already, like, gone through that sort of downgrade in status, the extra humiliation of this is very personal rather than it being just like, you know, a retribution. It just feels like this is somebody on... it's a father-son relationship. On this level, it's just more devastating and mean. And because I have gotten to know him a little bit better, and we have that moment where he, like, confesses to Kobe that he does still, like, care about his dad and admire him, it worked really well for me. I just genuinely was like, oh, my God, this poor kid, like, you know. Um... So I was sort of impressed with the way that that all went down. I expected it to be a lot more like, I guess I have to pretend to care about this, but I really did to a degree. And Kobe, they wind up like about to uh, fire on the little, you know, dinghy basically that Morgan stole in order to escape from the ship. And that would wind up killing Helmet. So Kobe winds up throwing himself in front of the cannon and being like, guys, let me do this. And there is this dude. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of him as like a secret agent, you know, or he, he just keeps reminding me of Agent Smith from The Matrix. Because even though he's got one of those sort of marine coats, over his shoulders his main outfit is like a really officious looking suit and he has a really ordinary face that like and when i say ordinary i mean like in the way that this show depicts people they always go for something pretty exaggerated in people's faces they'll have a weird nose or a big chin or a weird haircut or a goatee that's odd or a beard that's weird and this guy has the most bland face and of a fedora that looks like it's straight out of like what I kept thinking of was Inspector Gadget to be honest um and this dude gets them to like not fire and he's like I don't know maybe the kid's a fool or maybe and he doesn't finish his sentence but as we find out later He's sort of like eyeballing their progress as well. He seems to be sort of like a um, monitor on behalf of Garp. And Kobe winds up catching up to the dinghy. He swims out. Precious little helmet is like so touched and delighted that Kobe would swim out there to save him. He can't believe it. Meanwhile, Morgan is just like, you two fucking losers on this little ship with me are you stand absolutely no chance at all and they fight him and he winds up eventually just throwing them overboard there's a moment where he like looks like he's gonna kill them and then he says you're not even worth killing which is one of those things that uh i always sort of wonder if that has ever actually happened because that's always a thing in so much is that like the bad guy will decide, oh, it's not even worth killing you just because we need these guys to stay alive. Right. And it never actually makes a lot of sense to me, like why they wouldn't. And it's just because the plot can't have these guys be killed. That's really the real reason. But I would love to know if there ever has been a moment where a genuine real life like monster Decided that somebody just wasn't worth it. Because I just don't see that. Um, But regardless, they get tossed overboard, which means that they survive despite all the odds. And all of this is like overshadowed by Luffy in Kobe's memory. Talking about how if he dies fighting for the thing that he wants most in the world, that's his ultimate goal, then he's fine with that. And Kobe just being like, I will totally subscribe to that concept like that to me that's heroic so i'm definitely gonna go for it and they get tossed off um eventually they are fished out of the water and rescued by garp who is just like after what happened um there these no two other people are i think somebody else is saying this about the two of them uh after what these two did you'll be kicked out for life and 
Let's see what truly lost causes you are. I doubt anywhere uh, would take you now. And then he says, you'd only burden them. You leave me no choice. Come with me to Navy headquarters. And the guy who's the head of this ship is like, wait, wait, what? You're going to have them. You're going to take them to Navy HQ. And he says, is that bad? Which I love. I love that. Like, it's not even him. Like, being like what would you do or do you want them or anything it's just a real question of just like why are you reacting this way what's up you know in in a way that i don't think not to like i think it'd be easy to be like he doesn't actually expect an answer or he's not ask, asking this question without already knowing how people are going to react there's a part of me that does almost think that this guy is not aware about like about what looks like it makes sense to people and what doesn't do you know what i mean like he i feel like he's the sort of person who sort of ba like winds up accidentally stumbling backwards into success but i can't be sure of that he just feels a little bit like a much more calmed down luffy to me you know, it's like Luffy in 50 years, once he has learned to keep that mon like internal monologue internal. Um, but I don't know. I could be wrong about that. There's just a whole like energy to him. Just when he says, is that bad? I really got the impression that he was actually asking that he was kind of like, well, what's what's the problem there? Um, and he asked the boys, are you two against it? If you want to run away, now's your chance. But I don't have any intention of letting you say no anyway. Um, and it ends with him saying, what an odd day this has been. And laughing. And then we go to Morgan, who is still on his little uh, dinghy floating away. And I really wonder what the hell is going to happen with this guy. Because he's like weirdly boring all things considered as a villain compared to so many of the people that we have met so far you know and i just can't decide whether i like the thing about him that makes him interesting is his connection to helma and kobe now more than his own like intimidation as he he just feels like such small potatoes at this point after having been introduced to the other villains that we have since meeting him. So I'm curious how this is going to go. Um, so that is the end of this episode. And then we move on to the next one, which uh, <laughs> let's see, what's the title of this? Kobe Meppo's resolve vice Admiral Garp's parental affection. Wow. I didn't catch that. Because I'm, you know, I've been told not to read these for like, but that is hilarious. <laughs> Parental affection. That feels like it's overstating it to me. But you know what? Sure. Go ahead. Um, so <laughs> I love Usopp telling himself stories. He's sitting on the, like, the roof of this uh, cabin on the ship just pretending that he's being greeted and adored by all of these people. Um, and meanwhile, Nami and Vivi are doing the actual work of navigating the ship and creating a map and figuring out where they're going. Sanji, for his part, is uh, cooking at the stove and he winds up making these lovely little uh, apple tarts, which look, I think it's, or is it pears? No, it's pears, I think. Guys, I want one. Just a detour real quick. Yes, please. Thank you. I think pears are one of like the most underrated fruits. They're the kind of thing that like when you get a bad one, it's pretty bad. So I can understand. But like if you get a bad peach, that's also really terrible. And peaches just get such more credit than pears do and a really good pear is just unbeatable it's just like there's no comparison so yeah i'm into it um but 
they wind up getting um, interrupted here by, oh, where, I was about to say the arrival of the uh, newspaper, but I forgot about the whole thing with the water drawing machine, which evidently you like sit on and use like a bicycle. And Luffy breaks it. And I thought that that was kind of it, but it turns out that they have a second one. And I was really confused about this, guys. What does this, like, is this a real thing? Y'all know, I don't know anything about any of this stuff. I assume that it's like pulling water from the ocean and purifying it somehow to make it drinkable. Is that what it's meant to be? I didn't understand this. Because why do they need a whole machine? I just, because she says she wants the water so she can take a bath. And I'm like, can't you just drop a bucket over the side or something? Like, I didn't really understand what this was meant to do. And all we see eventually is like Luffy climbing onto the bicycle part and going off like, you know, at 100 miles an hour. And I didn't really understand what was meant to be going on there exactly. Um, so... <laughs> Then, then we go to the paper um, and Vivi's talking about how we should be lucky. We should feel lucky that we can still get news all the way out here. And this is when Nami comes across something in the paper and gets really, really weird about it and winds up like turning the page and not telling her and being like very shady. And she keeps sort of looking over the paper at Vivi in this particular way that feels to me like she's suspicious of her somehow. And then Luffy recognizes his friend in the paper. He points him out and he's like, Hey, that's, that's my uh, friend Kobe in there. And I love that. It's a picture of Kobe and helmet clinging to one another and crying. <laughs> Poor Kobe would not be, gratified to know that his photo is in the paper looking like that and guys nami reads this article out loud and i could not stop laughing vice admiral garp's warship has arrived at navy headquarters the picture was taken right after they crossed over reverse mountain just as expected vice admiral garp had a relaxed imposing look however there were some young marines whose faces froze with fear I swear to God, I wish so much that this was more what our news was like. Just like, well, you know, everybody says that he's real chill and he looked super chill. This thing that uh, made other people literally piss their pants, he seemed to have no reaction to. There's just something about like the editorializing on it that I really thought was funny. Um, and this is when we jump to the Navy headquarters and we get to see, I really did enjoy this. We get to see Helmet and Kobe introduced to what their routine is going to have to be. So they come in and they hear uh, 2000 pushups start. And we see these like really muscular sweating guys and they're doing it on like their fingertips, rope crossing, 100 round trips, run 200 laps. Those who can't finish within one hour will be penalized with another 100 laps. Practice matches. Don't stop until you faint. And all of this, like they're looking in at it, realizing wow, we are super duper not up to it, actually. And yeah, th this is one of those things that um, those of us who are used to being good at a lot of stuff really quickly and easily have a, a particular difficulty with. And I say those of us, but I mean me. Um, whenever you start off, if you've been, you know, not really doing a lot of exercise and you pick it up again, the hardest part is making yourself keep going when you're really bad at it still. Because even when you were good at it and you know the right postures to take and how to do the exercises, that does not change that your body, it, it can only handle so much. You know, it's out of practice. It doesn't have the conditioning for the, the like breathing and heart rate. And there just comes a point where 
you may have all the will in the world to continue and your body just won't. And the key is to recognize that that will be how it is for some time and doing it anyway. But I personally have a really hard time with that part because not only do I not like being bad at something, but I don't like being reminded how much I have let myself slip. It just feels like I'm like my face is being rubbed in my failure to keep up on the thing to begin with, which I already feel so bad about that it make it like accentuates that for me. And so I just get really worn down with discouragement on that front. It can be so hard to break through that. So I just, these two watching this and being like, oh my God, we are so out of our league. I was like, man, like I don't, in this context, it's a very different situation, but I still know what it feels like to look at people doing shit that you just can't imagine ever being able to do yourself, you know? And that doesn't mean you won't. There, like with so many things, you just don't expect that it'll ever be possible. And you look back and you're like, oh, wow, I used to not even be able to do the very basics. And now that's nothing to me. But it at the time when you begin, it's just a, it feels like way too much. Um, and this is when uh, they kind of off to the side, have their conversation where Helmut's saying, like, maybe we did come here too early. Like, the way we are right now, we're not going to make it here. There's a proper order for doing things. Maybe we should try again after we've at least trained ourselves more. Let's do that. Even if we're missing, no one will care. And Kobe gets really mad. And it's like, you said that you would surpass your father. And Helmut says... Well, I will, but if I do all those things that they were just saying, I'll die. And Kobe says, wouldn't you be happy if that's the case? Once you've decided to do something like that, and then we again get a flashback to Luffy. Once you've decided to become like that, if you can die fighting for that, you should be happy. <laughs> and like... I really do understand the mentality, but there is a point at which, like, you got to walk before you can run, kid, you know? Um, and Helmet says, fighting? What do you mean? And Kobe says, against yourself, which I rather liked that idea, the fact that you're sort of fighting yourself in some ways, because as much as that can be leveraged into a place that's unhealthy, I think to a degree, you have to admit that's like partially what's happening. There is going to be an aspect of you that wants to quit. There's going to be an aspect of you that's like, is this really worth it? Like, come on. And you have to learn when to recognize that's the voice that's chiming in and not the voice of reason being like, okay, no, but you really do need a break or you're going to hurt yourself. Um, so, you know, you just have to be careful with that sort of mentality. And it turns out that Grop is standing right there and he's like running away. You guys aren't going to disgrace me, are you? And then he punches the two of them. And says you are you can be easily replaced if you want to run, then hurry up and do it. And I was like, what is going on with this guy just punching them? Like, they, that keeps happening. Um, and Kobe pipes up with, we've come this far fully prepared to die if necessary. And Garp is basically like, oh, really? Die? Well, how about you just like go and carry out your fucking basic orders and get to work then? And they go. So we see the two of them doing their chore boy chores. And at night, they're sitting in like the dorm room and talking about Garp and uh, that he's feared by everyone. And Kobe's trying to study 
and he's getting annoyed that Helmet is not seeming to take all of this real seriously. Um, and <laughs> I kind of liked this conversation. Um, Helmet says at one point, he's just, he stands up and he just says, you know what? I've changed my mind. I miss living the way that I used to live. I quit. He just stay I will I'm 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 done with this shit. And Kobe is like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, and you're saying that now? Like, once we become Navy officers, you're not going to feel this way. And he turns around and says, That's the thing. We can't run away nor can we slack off. If that's the case, there's only one way to go back to how I used to live by becoming important quickly. And we have, uh, this is when Kobe says we have to work hard steadily and with patience. Do you think that there is an easy way? And Helmet says doing only chores and continuing to wait around won't get us anywhere, so I think I'll strengthen my body. And Kobe says, you're kidding, right? You know that's not possible. Which I thought was a really odd response because that felt like the whole point. But then, what? How, like, he goes on to say, we work so hard during the day that we're physically a wreck. Let's go to bed now. And I was like... Oh, okay. I see what he's, what he means. I was just like, I was under the impression that was Kobe's intent to begin with. And I don't know why I thought that because we don't actually see them exercising, but I just had the thought that now that they were here, we were going to wind up seeing them like doing things to attempt to reach, you know, the, the goals that they had seen set for the Marines. So this like whole confrontation winds up just sort of bringing us to a point that I had thought we already were at and Kobe's, you know, yelling at him. It's impossible. There's no way that your body can keep up. And he does the impossible, impossible, definitely impossible that he hasn't done since we saw him like arguing with Luffy and it's just a return to, as he puts it, like his wimpy way of thinking. And when Helmet turns and smiles at him and it's like, there's a, uh, like no turning back. If you want it, you may as well go for it. Kobe is like, you know what, dude, this is exactly the shit that I am supposed to be doing. You're right. And I'm really sorry that I like, didn't, I wasn't on board with you, but yeah. All right. Let's do it. And it's not about whether we can, it's about whether we have the will. And so we see the two of them uh, going out and, you know, doing sit-ups with one another and fighting with one another, like grappling and running. Um, there's like a montage of the, uh, of Garp, like having a, pair of birds in the palm of his hand which i have to imagine is meant to represent the two of them there's also a thing like earlier where there's a uh, a pot with two like sprouting plants in it that are just baby plants um and the chore boys are each like figuring out how many loads of dishes they can carry to and from the kitchen as well trying to like uh outdo one another and it's, this is the kind of thing that has given me as a young person, a, it gave me a really skewed idea of what it is like to become fit because it's always done in a montage. I would love to see a movie or a show that is, that doesn't show everything happening this quickly um, that shows like the fuck ups and the desires to quit and the setbacks and whatnot, because I always entered into my attempts to become fit, imagining that it would be like a montage and it's not kids. 
it's just living your life. And that's a lot less fun than getting something set to music that you can just like fly through. Let me tell you. Um, but eventually, uh, they get to this point where they're talking about Luffy and Garp overhears them. And there's this whole like moment of confrontation where he is like, well, you're really not supposed to be friends with pirates like that. So if you were other people, you would have to be removed from the Navy. I think that you are aware of this. Um, but fortunately, I am the only one who knows it. And he says, do you want to be a Marine? And he basically does the sort of like Morpheus, like come at me sort of vibe. And they do. And he defeats them with no effort whatsoever. And then they get up again and they come at him again. And he's so busy laughing because he's like apparently laughing at Kobe, but it doesn't even seem like he really is. It's more, it feels like genuine amusement that the two of them are able to come forward and actually like punch him in the gut while he's distracted by his laughter. And I can't help but think that he like let them land that punch because I don't see, but yeah, he says people have been calling me eccentric for quite a while. And especially this time they said all sorts of things. Since I brought you here, I've had to train you. And I know that you are, that you had like worked to make your body stronger, but I had to see whether or not your minds were stronger because, you know, it would be very easy for you to give up. So I tested you to see if you were de like as determined as I needed you to be. And they ask like, so what's the verdict? And he says, I'll acknowledge your determination, but, and the camera turns and the two of them are on the ground, completely busted because he fucked them up. And he says, when you, it comes to weakness, you guys take the cake. So you're about to have an intense training session every day. Be ready for that. And I'm going to overlook the situation with you being friends with a pirate. But you are going to have to like really pull it out and work hard on this. And the episode ends. We cut to Nami looking at the newspaper and she takes the paper and like hides it in a drawer, but we don't actually see like all it says, uh, my chill. And I don't know if that's significant or if that's just meant to be like an ad that's in there, you know, and it's not actually even relevant. Nothing else is actually, you know, readable on there. And uh, it, she like looks over at Vivi with this sort of secretive air. And then we have Luffy in his sleep talking about getting to the little garden. And that's the end of the episode. So, yeah, that's that. Um, but, yeah, I'm really curious about what's going on in the newspaper. So... All right, guys, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you all again very much for hanging out and being in the chat with me. Thank you also to Bernadette for commissioning this episode. Appreciate you. And I'll be seeing you all again soon with a new episode in two weeks because I'm taking next week off. So until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>